welcome to Amateur Redneck Workshop. I'm Harold and uh, it's hot in Houston and it's humid. It's, uh, my neighbor's weather station down the street uh, said 91.5 and it's just now about noon so you know it's going to be hotter today. At least it's going to be that hot for sure. Anyway, aside from the weather, I was thinking about back in the 70s when I used to overhaul motor motorcycle crankshafts and motorcycles and bore cylinders and all that kind of thing. And I thought, well, probably it might be interesting for people to see how you rebuild a motorcycle crankshaft, or at least how you used to. I, I was told that uh, they just throw them away these days and get a new one. So, except for Harleys, I understand they still do Harleys the way I'm going to show you. This right here is a motorcycle crankshaft. I think it's out of some particular Honda. I don't know. If, that's my guess. Uh, I got it from a, from a relative that's got a motorcycle shop. And, and it's ruined yep, in here. It's, the rod is actually in good shape. And if you, if you look at this crankshaft, you can see this rod when I rolled around. It's not bolted together. It's one solid piece. Big end and little end. And that's the, the normal way that you make motorcycle rods and motorcycle crankshafts. They're pressed together. They're what you call a built-up crankshaft. And I understand they did airplanes that same way, you know, the piston engine airplanes. But I've never seen one, so I can't say. But that's what I was told, that they build up the crankshaft just like this. Now right here, you got your crank pin. This is a little bit big of a crank pin compared to what I used to to push out when I was alive. This is this is a crank pin out of I say I think this looks like it was a two cycle engine that somebody didn't have enough oil in. This engine I believe got all plain bearings because this this plain bearing was on it and I right behind the gear and I, I pushed the gear off so it wouldn't be in my way. And so I'm imagining that the the rod's got plain bearings in it too. Apparently the oil comes in this end, goes up through here, and goes into the pin and lubricates the rod. That's my guess. We'll find out when we get this thing apart. Now one of the first things you've got to do, you need to get some calipers or something, something that'll measure. I'm doing this in millimeters. Those motorcycles, especially Japanese motorcycles, are in millimeters. And we'll measure this thing, and it appears to be 66 millimeters wide. That's important because if we, when you put it back together, you want it to still be 66 millimeters wide, not 67 or 65, but 66. Now you, you get a you know a few little bits of uh, allowance there, you know, for making a mess. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to move over on the hydraulic press. Now I get a bearing shackle, and we'll start disassembling this crankshaft. Um, and if you remember back, if you saw the one where I was working on the Magic Wand, that worked great. It worked better than I thought once I got that fiberglass pole that was real light, and I got that hose on it. And the little pump, the only, the only fly in the ointment right now is that little pump puts up an awful lot of pressure and three or four times while I was running it, it blew the, the little nozzle off the end of the hose, you know, the little spray nozzle. But next time around, I'm going to glue that spray nozzle onto the hose and I, I turn the pump on and turn it off and it'd spray, you know, and when I see it, could see the spray start to fall, come down, I'd flip the switch and turn it back on and it'd spray up real big, you know, and I just sort of click, 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 click while I while I did it, but it reached up on t uh, the sides of the house. And I even got up to the top of the chimney and got all, the, well, most of the mold killed off up there. So that's one of my better projects. <laughs> all right, I'll shut up and we'll get over to the hydraulic press and start taking this crankshaft apart. Let's get started with this thing. Uh, my press being on wheels, I moved it out here in the middle of the floor so we can see what's going on. Because it was over there in the darkest part of the, my garage. So what I'm going to do to press this thing, I'm going to turn the long part down to get it out of my way. And I'm going to put the, uh, let me turn this little viewfinder so I can see what you're seeing. I'm going to put the 
bearing shackles in here and this is not shaped really good for this kind of thing because it's got heavy weights on this side of the throat and a thin spot over here so it may take a little bit of ingenuity for me to set it up I'll have to put something in there to take up some of that space I guess they probably didn't figure on any redneck coming along and want to rebuild it. I know back in the old days I rebuilt a whole lot of two cycles. There was uh, Suzuki came out with some three cylinder two cycle engines and they were water cooled even and they uh, they had a problem with fouling out the uh, the central cylinder, the center cylinder and then after they fouled it out, the gasoline would accumulate in there and eventually they would shred the seals from the pressure. And they were taking them, I guess the Suzuki would pay them on warranty, and they were throwing these crankshafts up underneath a, uh, a workbench there in their, in their shop. And I suppose they were buying new crankshafts or having Suzuki give them new crankshafts for the warranty work. But I knew a guy that uh, that was in with the shop uh, boss there, whatever you'd want to call him. And uh, so he knew that I could rebuild crankshafts and he said, well, can you rebuild these three cylinder jobs? And I said, sure, however many cylinders you got. So he'd bring them over. I charged him $40. And I don't know what he charged the Suzuki dealer but uh, I rebuilt a whole bunch of those with three cylinder jobs and it was money in my pocket so I didn't care whether the Suzuki dealer thought he was doing it or I was doing it. Alright, I'm going to have to find something to shim up under this side of the crankshaft <clears throat> that's a uh, unexpected thing. Let's see what I got in the here. Well, yeah. All right, I'm going to level all this out, and then I'll be back. All right, I've uh, shimmed up under the thin side here, and we'll find out if my 10-ton press is still able to handle a motorcycle crankshaft. There was only one that I ever couldn't do, and it was one that I got together and couldn't get back apart again. It was on a bull taco. And I had to go to a guy that had a 30-ton press to get the thing apart again. All right, I heard it pop, so let's move it. Now then, I've got to screw that down or move it or something because I've run into the crankshaft. So I can't move it over a little bit like that. And then the end of the crankshaft there. Thought I would have had clearance, but I didn't. Alright, so we will proceed on. Everything's clear. And I know that this thing's going to fall out of the bottom. I've got a plastic uh, container there underneath it. <coughs> I'd like to catch it with my hands before it goes, um, <laughs> but it's so hard to reach up under there, you know, so well, I think it's about ready to go through, I don't know, I'll have to do something. Alright, we're really close to coming apart, I'm going to get a little piece of rope and tie onto that thing so it doesn't fall. Here we go, this should do the job. There's a hole in the bottom of the thing. That'll catch the pieces for me so they don't just fall all over the place. And yeah, I apply the pressure going upwards. 
All right, there we go. That's the part. Let me pick up the pieces. All right, the only thing hit the floor was my little pushing part there. All right, so now then, we'll pull the little guy out of this uh, mess here. Get all these pieces of metal out that I had shimmed with. I would think if you were going to build a, a crankshaft for a modern engine of some kind, that this would probably be a, the best design there is. After all, if it's good enough for Honda and Yamaha and Suzuki and, and so on and so on and Harley Davidson and everybody else, it ought to be good enough for your project. At least that's what I think. All right, so. Well, I guess I'm going to have to cut that thing loose. Let me find a pocket knife. All right. We'll cut the little booger loose and I can hang on to it down here. I think we'll cut it loose. Ah! All right. This is awkward, isn't it? I'll just go ahead and take this part. Well, I can't <laughs> take this part off. And we'll pull it up out of there. With all the pieces of the bearing shackles falling everywhere. Alright, so I said I figured this was a plain bearing on the bottom. Let's find out if I was right. No, I wasn't. Needle bearings on the bottom of the rod. All right, so there's a little washer there that came off that goes back on. But if you were rebuilding this guy, you'd turn it over, push this pin out the other way, get a new pin, new rod, new bearings, put in there and push her back together. Uh, I guess you'll probably want to see me push it back together. Here's the little spacer here. It fell down in the bottom there along with all the goodies. Move that over. Now then, I'll find something to cut that loose and we'll come back and discuss it or, or something. All right, like I said, if uh, I were actually rebuilding this crankshaft, I would have pushed out that pin out of it. <coughs> and I'd have put another pin there and pushed it in until it came out even with the, the side there, okay? But I'm not rebuilding it, and it's a darn good thing because after dropping all those bearings, I, I dragged the floor with a magnet, and uh, all I found was a, a dead cockroach and one more bearing, so I came up two bearings short. That means that what we're gonna have to do here is just pretend that we've got it rebuilt properly when we get through. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the put this part back on it, okay? This one crank throw here. Uh, one of the aids I'm going to use is a common square. And I'm going to use it to uh, make sure that it heads down right. So, I'm going to lay this across here. And I guess I'm adding it to move that a little. Screw this down tight to hold against it. I need to turn it just a little bit. <coughs> Alright, now that I'm going to use this square to see if I can tell if it's sort of close. You know, it's not going to be real close, but it could be sort of close. I know when I. Uh, I was watching these guys in this long time ago Suzuki dealer. They were putting the one cylinder crankshafts together with a tri square like this, and they would squeeze them together, and that was all the straightening they got. But really, you need to, uh, to do a little more like in the Tom Lipton job and put them between centers and lathe and see to it that they're actually straight. 
And I had a guy that was the guy that was telling me about them doing airplane engines. He said they just put them together and stick it back in the engine and let them run straight. And I, I don't know if that's a fact or not, but it sure didn't sound good to me. I wouldn't want to do it like that. All right, so as near as I can tell, that's probably not straight entirely. It's hard to tell right there. I'll squeeze it together a little bit and then we'll we'll take it and check it. Alright, that's started. That's squeezed together a little bit. This one's a little bit, a bit more difficult than one that's made with totally flat surfaces all the way around. But, you know, you got what you got. Take this guy here. Hold him like this. And he is nowhere near straight. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go get an aluminum hammer and I'm going to tap it a little bit. If I was doing this for money, I would have made sure my aluminum hammer was close by. And I couldn't find it right off and I'm running out of battery. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use this hammer. Like I said, it's a throwaway crankshaft. And actually the aluminum hammer <coughs> is the secret to putting the whole thing together because once you put it between centers to see which way it's off, you have to use that aluminum hammer to adjust it. Let's take a look at this and see what this looks like. Way off, way off. I can see by eye that it was way off. Still can't. Now this steel hammer is going to leave some marks, but my aluminum hammer doesn't. If I get desperate, I'll take the thing and push it back apart and turn it around more. This one, lack of experience, because I haven't touched one in 40 years, and uh, the odd shapes here kind of throwing me a bit, but we'll get there, pretty sure. Still way off. So I'm going to turn off the camera and probably take it over the vise and get it more straight or whatever. Okay, so while you guys were sleeping, I realized that the way I was doing it wasn't going to get me anywhere. And I took it back apart and I have lined it up better this time. And we'll go back one more try to put it back together. Whoa, now that was too impressive. I have to move closer on to it. Alright. I think the best thing for me to do is to do like I did when I took it apart. I'll use a piece of metal all the way across to equalize it. what I did with that piece of metal, but here's another one. Alright, well, I'm not really over it, so there. That's pretty much over it.
hopefully I'm going to set it up where I'm in the neighborhood. And I'm not guaranteeing this is going to be a quality job. Like I said, if I was doing it for money, I would probably set up some kind of a jig to hold it straight in the first place. All right, so try one more attempt. Of course, it gets harder to move the further I get with it. Which tells me that as big a diameter as this crank pin is, it'll be difficult for me to move once I've got it together. And that looks like it's together right there. So what I need to do is check and see if I'm still 66 millimeters. All right, let me go get a caliper. As often as I'm knocking stuff off the press, I don't want to keep my caliper over here. But I'd surely destroy it. Alright, that says 66.3. So I've got to squeeze it just a tiny bit more. Which is normal. According to my previous experience, I always had to squeeze just a tiny bit more. case it might have, take it back out and measure it again. Didn't move it a bit. All right. The thing is, you don't want to just go too far one way and have to come back, go too far the other way and so on. You just see something back and forth. This, that just wears out the the hole the crank pins in it doesn't do any good for you. Alright, let's give that a try. Moved it. This is the time consuming part because when you get down to here, you don't want to make really big moves because you'll go too far and then you got to start taking it back apart again. You'll go too far. All right, I heard that move. Again. Sixty six. Okay. That's pretty lucky. Usually I have to do that five or six or seven times. But anyway, now we've got it squeezed back together. Are the throws running true? I know I'm bound to have heard somebody say that. And uh I'll go and set up the lathe and we'll check to see. Now this isn't exactly the way <clears throat> that I would do it if I was doing this for money, so to speak. Uh, the fact of the matter is this end on this end has got damaged just why the uh, why the crankshaft is, is a throwaway. And there went the center hole on that end. This end needs a very large center which I didn't put in there I just stuck it against a piece of metal normally when I do these and it's the sure enough real thing I put a dead center in here and a dead center in here 
and then put the crankshaft between the dead centers. That way when you turn it, if there's any imbalance, it'll show up on your micrometer. Okay? It's out of out of true. I don't know if you can see that micrometer. I doubt it. I'm gonna I'm gonna move you around a little bit and let you look at it. But this is how you true the thing up. Hang on and take a little nap. Alright, now remember, <clears throat> this isn't if you was doing this for the real thing, you want a dead center in each end. Now I have seen back in the day they sold stands that had, uh, uh, you know, a piece come up on the side and centers in it. And it wasn't a lathe, it was just, uh, you know, a bracket with dead centers. Which is really all you need, something that keeps the crankshaft straight. But you can see that we're too far off to be good there. Alright. And I don't know how much of that's because this, you know, this there's no centers there. I'm just running it stuck up inside that drill chuck. But even so, I got pretty close just for a tri square and, and old eyes, you know. Now then you say, well, what am I going to do about that that wobble? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a two before, and I'm going to set one side of this throw on it. I'm going to get my aluminum hammer on the other side. And I'm going to smack the heck out of it. And that will cause a little shift. And then I'll bring it back and I put it back between the centers. And I turn them again. And I can see it maybe move one thousand, two thousand. Go back, whack it real hard again. And I always keep one throw on the two before because that's soft, the wood's soft. Using an aluminum hammer on the southern. You can see where I dropped this little bugger in the floor there a while ago. I wouldn't give something like that back to a customer because I might not get <laughs> any business from them again. But this this is just by way of demonstration so you can know how to do it if you decided to or, or how it's done. And when finally you've got that that uh, area of the crankshaft, when it rolls around and sitting on zero all the time, it's time to deliver it to your customer and get your money. Nothing really complicated or highly technical, just uh, a lot of work. All right, sports fans, uh, fans, we've got uh, the thing supposed to theoretically rebuilt, okay? Ready to go back in the motorcycle and roar around town or across the dirt or wherever that particular motorcycle goes. Uh, like I said, you want to do a little bit more care than what I did there. That was just theoretical. And when I said to set the one throw on a, on a two before and whack the heck out of it with a, an aluminum hammer on the other side, of course, lead would work too. I don't mean go whack, 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 whack. I mean just one smack and go back and measure it because yeah, there too you don't want to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Nothing to be gained from that. And my motivation in showing you this, because I know you're not going to, you're probably not going to overhaul your motorcycle crankshaft. I don't know, you might. But my motivation in showing you this was if you're building model engines, it seems to me like that would be the way to go. Make yourself two throws, make the same size hole in them. A lot of ways you could do that. And get you a crank pin and press the thing together and true it up. And I think that would be just a, a ton easier than having a long tool sticking into a, a solid piece where you've cut the whole crankshaft out of a solid piece or any of the many other ways I've seen people making model engine crankshafts on YouTube. They look to me like they're doing it the hard way when this is the easy way, it's got to be good. Motorcycles have got a lot of horsepower and these crankshafts hold up. They don't slip, bend, whatever, you know. All right, well, let's... Uh, Let's go see if we can find Bubba or Oli or somebody and uh, call it a day. Well, Oli finally scraped up enough money, you know, to fly back to Norway and visit his relatives there. And so he went and got on the plane, picked a seat there in the front by the window and sat down. A little bit, this other guy come along and said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, you'll have to move. That's my seat. He says, I got the ticket for it right here. Oh, he says, no, he says, you don't understand. He says, I need to sit in this seat so when we get to the airport, I can jump out and meet my relatives. 
and no way of talking the guy could do get over to move so he went and got the stories and she come by and she says sir you're gonna have to move you're in this guy's seat and Otis says no he says you don't understand he says I'm going back to Norway to visit my uh, relatives he says I need to be in this seat go so when the plane gets there I can jump out and, and greet my relatives so in Sturgis, there wasn't any way she'd get him to move. She talked and talked, you know, and this wasn't on United, by the way. And uh, anyway, so uh, she went and got the captain. And the captain come back, and he told uh, Ole, you know, that he needed to move. And Ole gave him the story about going to Norway. The captain leaned over and whispered something in Ole's ear. And Ole said, oh, all right, okay. And he got up and moved the seat back, you know, in the back of the plane. And the stewardess and the pastor sitting there said, well, just, just what did you tell him that, you know, to get him to move when nobody else could do it? And the captain says, well, he says, I just told him this seat wasn't going to Norway. <laughs> well, that's all, folks. Uh, Y'all try to subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Leave a comment if you've got something to say. And above all, remember, keep on keeping on. Bye now.